Welcome to this talk on experiencing the importance of syllabic rhythmicity, oral subvocalization reading of conventional poetry. This research was done together with Lars Benjetsen at the Center for Cognitive Science at the University of Freiburg. Our lead question is, why does a poetic rhythm function during silent or oral reading? Let's first look at some background aspects for investigating uh, rhythmic reading of conventional poetry. And let's start with a little example. Please read the following verses quickly. Did you read orally or did you read silently? Did you realize a rhythmic and or a sound gestalt? Well, this example serves to exemplify our working definitions, uh, aside from Ravignani and Medicine 2017. We've got rhythm, defined as a pattern of events and time that is a specific succession of durations. We've got meter, uh, which is the hierarchical organization of temporal events based on stress and other spectral properties. We've got pulse, aka beat, which is the psychological tendency to superimpose an isochronous script to a rhythmic sequence. And we maybe got something like isochrony or quasi-isochrony, which is defined as a rhythmic pattern where all intervals have roughly equal duration. And the letter brings us back to poetry being in between language and music. Well, London wrote that meter involves when events will happen while grouping involves what events will happen and claimed that there is no when in language compared with music. However, conventional poetry is characterized by the composed sequence of syllables and their respective phonemic quality, thus allowing for at least some degree of timing that is for a where, a when, and a what. Which is why already Patel, although he stated that there is lack of uh, evidence for isochrony in natural speech, concluded that conventional poetry uh, might be the exception. So if this holds true, um, the strongest correspondences between music and language appear to be between musical syntax and linguistic phonology, uh, not musical syntax and linguistic syntax. <clears throat> so metrically systemized or even regularized rhyme language should, similar to music, allow for rhythmic units and an audible gestalt. There is, however, another important aspect to consider when researching reading poetry. And that is that in classical reading research, the typical approach is to divide uh, into perception versus production studies. However, during uh, silent reading, we still have something like production. Um, here, perception and to a certain degree, production interact gradually just without the physical output, which is the crux. Um, previous research backs this up. For example, the famous same size sister uh, experiment by Fodor uh, showed that implicit prosody can influence sentence processing. And in 2011, Brain and Clifton had participants read stress alternating uh, homographs, for example, recent versus percent. And they, these were embedded in limericks, and the lexical stress was determined by the preceding word material. And we saw show that syntactic reanalysis of a critical region elicited longer, re, uh, longer uh, reading times when it also required the reanalysis of the metrical pattern. Um, ERP data from a later experiment, which investigated the uh, uh, processing of stress patterns, um, suggests that implicit prosody indeed is processed similarly to explicit prosody. <clears throat> However, it is unclear where in poetry the information on the rhythmic gestalt exactly comes from. Um, because regardless of the mode, whether it's silent or over reading, the text itself is non-acoustic. Um, it's an auditive, non-physical input. So coming back to our lead question, uh, we refined it by asking, how do readers realize a poetic a rhythmic stream from an unfamiliar and silent textual input? How do readers infer 
a beat from the silent rhythmic gestalt and rotator meter. To find partial answers to this really big puzzle, um, we conducted two, two experiments. Um, the first experiment focused on the questions, are eye movements sensitive to poetic rhythm? And can we find indicators for rhythmic subvocalization? And the second experiment tried to investigate the functional role of top-down prediction, such as stress units, for example, iambic or trochaic, and bottom-up information, such as the syllabic phonemic quality, <clears throat> as well as on the role of musical activity. Um, please note, in this talk, I will focus more on the first experiment um, since I have focused, or since I'm going to focus, depending on when you see uh, the video, uh, going to focus more on the second experiment in the ENN7 talk. Otherwise, it would be completely the same information. So from here on, it differs. Um, okay, let's start with uh, the one on rhythmic subvocalization. And based on the just explained premises, let's quickly recap the concept of subvocalization. It implies hearing an inner voice, which is characterized by inhibited speech motor articulation. And most importantly, it can distinguish between volume, pitch, and tempo. And also, we do know that eyes react to speech aspects and also to form. Um, indeed, eye movements during silent reading share comparable closely aligned patterns with speech uh, shown by Gagel at our uh, 2021. 20, uh, and uh, Shapers in 2013 uh, could show that pupils delayed in reaction to rhyme uh, violations in spoken limerick processing. <clears throat> and there is growing evidence um, that eye movements reflect effects of genre, like the prose of poetry, um, or uh, they reflect also um, structure repetition with uh, variation, aka parallelistic dictions, such as rhyme or meter. However, research using eye tracking and focusing on rhythmic sublocalization in silent reading of metrically regularized rhyme language um, and how it depends on a clear visual presentation as poetry was still rare when we conducted this experiment. So picking up a rhythm in conventional poetry should result in building up auditive expectations that are based on a rhythmic audible gestalt generated through subprofessation. Here's a little example. Please, this time, read silently and quickly the stanzas. Well, maybe you've just sensed some kind of rhythmic oddness. This is because we added rhythmic anomalies. We have like three anomalies. A rhyme anomaly, where we introduced a deviation from the expected rhyme scheme. A metric anomaly, where one or two syllables were added to break the local metrical uh, figure within a stanza. And finally, a combination of both uh, metric and rhyme anomaly. We expected that if readers pick up the rhythm, reading should be disturbed by anomalies, and potentially more so in poem layouts than in prose layouts, reflected in their movements. The task for participants was to read the text silently on the monitor, uh, similarly to uh, these pictograms here. And they were displayed as either the original or the manipulated version. No comprehension questions were given, uh, no memory questions were given. 38 participants' eye movements were recorded using SR Research Island 1000. And eight MRL poems were prepared as stimuli. Our predictors were firstly factor layout with two levels, poem and prose. Uh, secondly, factor version with two levels consistent and inconsistent. And thirdly, within factor factor anomaly type with three levels, namely metric rhyme and metric enzyme. Using a Latin square design, um, the stimuli were distributed to four lists with each eight items and presentation order was randomized. The reading time measures were single fixation duration, gaze duration, regression path duration, and total reading times. 
And for all we computed residual reading times from all the words in the poem, and we controlled for lexical, structural, and ocular variables, for example, word length or number of syllables. We calculated linear mixed effects models, and our main model focused on where the anomaly occurred. And for this, we used a two-stage approach. In stage one, to account for predictors that are known to uh, affect reading time, a base model was fitted and residualized across all words. And in the second stage, we used the resulting residual log reading times for the critical interest areas. That is, they were fitted with the three design factors, layout, version, and anomaly time. Um, we also maybe quickly look at um, eye tracking measures for those who uh, don't work with eye tracking. So a uh, single fixation duration um, are the cases uh, when there's only one fixation on a word. And gaze duration um, is the sum of fixation durations in an interest area during the first pass from the first fixation in an interest area until the eye uh, ex exits uh, the IA for the first time in any direction. Regression path duration is the sum of all fixations from the first fixation on the interest area up uh, until a saccade leaves the interest area to the right for the first time. And it includes all the saccades to the left. And total reading time is the sum of all fixations in uh, an interest area. So um, results for the main model show a fairly similar pattern for all four eye tracking measures. Um, fixation and reaction times for the metric anomalies were elevated in the poem layout, as you can see, which seems to be mandatory to detect them. Uh, readers seem to be disrupted as if they would dwell on the word itself to resolve the rhythmic disruption when their expectation is not fulfilled. And in prose layout, the gaze durations and the regression path durations revealed longer reaction times for the rhyme anomalies, which suggests that readers expected rhymes um, due to the rhythmic sound gestalt, also in the prose uh, version. And the rhyme and meter anomaly resulted in uh, shorter gaze durations, but longer regression path durations uh, in the prose layout. So seemingly this one triggered a uh, very, very early regressive saccades during first pass reading. We also calculated the load contributions, which is a measure that calculates the time spent rereading a previous region within the regression path of a later region. For example, it's selective rereading, that's aka the fixations, only um, the pre-rhyme. Selective rereading of only the pre-rhyme within the regression path of its subsequent rhyme word. So we found in both layouts uh, that rhyme anomalies triggered rereading, selective rereading of the pre-rhyme, um, suggesting that readers try to solve this detected anomaly across line. And the combined anomaly, excuse me, here are the ones for the right, uh, and the combined anomaly uh, triggered selective free reading only in a poem layout, as you can see. So does the visual cues appear to be helpful for resolving such a severe rhythmic anomaly? Um, load contribution on six words before the critical interest area revealed that only in prose layout, the metrical, and less so, the combined anomaly caused selective free reading of the local context. So we also uh, had looked at um, the all other words of the poem, and we used uh, our complete model for that. So the com complete model focused on effects of the design factors on all other words of the poem, except the ones we looked at in the main model. Um, all lexical predictors uh, from the base model, um, for example, indicators for sublocalization, like number of syllables and consonant vowel, call, uh, consonant vowel quotient, as well as structural and ocular motor ones were included in this one, plus factor layout and factor version. Again, for all the time measures, we computed residual reading times. Um, generally, in all four eye tracking measures, for the residual number of syllables, 
we'd found a reliable effect, uh, which is important because here, uh, for the residual number of syllables, word length had been requested out. So thus the effect found reflects pronunciation length. And this strongly suggests that subvocalization took place in silent reading. We also found an interaction with version, um, meaning that words with more syllables were fixated even longer when anomalies occurred, indicating a more cautious subvocalization based reading style. Um, to conclude, layout differentially affects the, process of the, uh, the processing of anomalies because the visual cues seem to be um, helpful or maybe even facilitate um, orientation and stress expectation management in poem layout. However, selective rereading in particular shows that metrically regularized uh, rhymed language had been captured uh, and processed in prose layout too. In general, the effect of anomalies indicates subvocalization. This interpretation is strengthened by a clear syllable effect that we found. So overall, the pattern of results suggests that eye movements are closely aligned with rhythmic subvocalization of metrically regularized rhyme language. So coming back to our research questions, we can say, yes, eye movements are sensitive to poetic rhythm, uh, rhythm and yes, uh, we find indicators for rhythmic subvocalization. Um, our other experiments try to investigate the functional role of a top-down prediction, such as stress units, that is iambic or trochaic, for example, and bottom-up information, such as a uh, syllabic uh, phonemic quality, as well as uh, the role of musical activity. Um, please, again, read this time aloud. Well, did the occurrence of tax irritate your rhythmic reading maybe a little? Mm, well, based on uh, this just experience phenomenon, um, maybe you have just experienced it. Um, we wanted to know to what extent is rhythmicity in the reading of conventional poems uh, determined by top-down prediction of metrical patterns um, and What's the functional role of bottom-up information in rhythmic pattern formation? And to explore this, uh, we replace random regular syllables with nonsensical tag syllables. Um, we use tag because it is often used also in musical training, like the tag, the tag, the tag, 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 etc. You know what I mean. Um, how does this affect uh, rhythmic reading? And how are these effects modulated by the subject's musical activity? Well, we recorded 17 participants' oral reading of poems, and um, each subject, uh, pardon, each subject uh, read nine poems categorized as iambic in its leading meter, or nine uh, which were categorized as trochaic in its leading meter. And stress and musical were coded as predictor variables, amongst others. So our lead hypothesis were: if readers project a derived metrical grid top-down, tax should not disturb rhythmic reading. But if phonological input bottom up governs somehow the rhythmic reading, then those tags should disturb the readers. Please just quickly check out uh, the procedure. Unfortunately, I don't have time for our examples, maybe in the Q&A. Well, after annotating the audio files automatically and manually in part, we calculated general, general linear mixed effects uh, models in R. And uh, we first looked at the syllable level and compared the syllable onset intervals, so syllable onset to syllable onset, as well as intensity of regular syllables with tag syllables. Now, for the syllable onset interval, for the regular syllables, we found that the strong syllables were spoken longer than the weak syllables that is expected. That's the red line over the blue line. And this effect was more pronounced uh, for musically active readers and also in iambic poems. For the tag syllables, we found that the weak tags were read longer than the strong tags 
That's uh, the blue line over the red line overall. But this effect was more pronounced for, uh, well, excuse me, this effect was more pronounced in the trochaic poems, as you can see. Uh, and the data here suggests that musically active readers make no distinction regarding uh, stress as well as meters. You see the lines uh, here in the graphical illust illustration are uh, uh, very near. Uh, whereas musically inactive readers exhibit longer uh, syllable onset intervals for the weekly stressed uh, tux and more so in a, a trochaic poem. So that's quite interesting. Um, for intensity, for the regular syllables, we found that strong syllables were louder than the weak, which is also uh, to expect. That's red line out, blue line again, and more so in the iambic version. Uh, musical active readers overall uh, read a little less uh, intense uh, in iambic than in a trochaic poem. And for the intensity for tag syllables, the data analysis showed that uh, overall strong tags were read more intense. However, there's a specific pattern behind this. Uh, musically active readers read stress tags more intensively in both iambic and trochaic, whereas musically inactive readers make no difference, not for prominence nor for meter marquee. So, to summarize, for regular syllables, we found a main effect for stress, as expected, for both uh, the syllable onset interval and intensity, as well as, albeit differently, for tag syllables. On tag syllables, musically active readers used intensity, uh, but not syllable onset intervals, to mark stress, except when there were too many tags in the line, uh, in trochaic lines especially. Um, further results shown in the ENN7 talk suggest that musically active readers shift articulatory projection of the metrical pattern from the syllable onset interval to intensity as the number of tags in line increases. Musically inactive readers appear to have difficulties to code stress on tag syllables, and our data could be interpreted as the musically inactive readers um, maybe having some experience of a clash of top-down and bottom-up processing here. So to conclude, the effect of tag syllables highlights the importance of bottom-up phonological information in establishing a metrical code. Musically active readers were more capable of maintaining the rhythmic structure, but qualitatively they used syllable intensity rather than duration to indicate stress on the tag syllables. And the syllable level is better suited than the NPVI for testing fine grained rhythmic aspects. Um, results on the NPVI also shown in the ENN7 talk. Um, the phonetic structure of syllables uh, within a poem's rhythmic gestalt, therefore, indeed, is important for extracting, updating, and maintaining a leading metrical grid while reading rhythmically. Uh, a poem. So, yes, our movements are sensitive to poetic rhythm, and we do find indicators for rhythmic subvocalization. Um, importantly, um, we find that bottom up and uh, top down um, interaction is something that is gradual, um, and also it seems to be something that is affected by uh, one's own musical activity. So musical activity might not change everything, but it definitely changes something here. So I hope uh, this was interesting for you. Um, I look forward to see you in the Q&A or at the ENN7 talk. And um, yes, well, thank you very much uh, for your attention, uh, your time, and uh, your interest in this research.